I love the fact that he brought all these guys with him, always with the Memphis Mafia. These guys were always around him. When I first started with Elvis in 1961, my capacity was uh, basically a gopher, <laughs> I guess you'd say. They were redneck boys. They wore funny little cuffs and things like that, but you know, they were hell of, they were good guys. Why he needed them. I never understood that. And there's a lot of people that wrote stories about all of us. Uh, we didn't help Elvis in his life, and we were all just be sponges taking things away from him. Well, those people don't know what they're talking about. They weren't there. They knew Elvis better than anyone, a small group of friends, relatives, and employees known affectionately as the Memphis Mafia. And Elvis started recruiting members long before he hit the big time. I grew up in North Memphis, uh, where Elvis did. Um, and one day I went to the local playground. And I went over to uh, try to get up a game. And um, there were five older boys uh, trying to put together a football game. This is 1954. That's how unpopular Elvis was in 1954. He couldn't get together six people. And Red West knew my older brother, and he knew I played uh, grade school football. So he said, Jerry, you want to play with us? And I said, sure. I didn't know who, you know who the other guys were, but little kid always wants to play with the older boys. One of those older boys, Red West, would be with Elvis for years, as would his cousin Sonny, who stumbled into the King's life back in 1958. We had a skating party that night, and I didn't know how to skate very well. And they had this game called War, where you chose up sides, and the object was to skate at each other when the whistle blows and knock each other down. So I went out there, and of course, I was put on the other side against Elvis and Red and Billy Smith and this girl named Melinda that was really stocky. And all of a sudden, something reaches up and grabs me behind my collar and just jerks me down. So I get up, she knocks me down again, grabs me, just throws me, always coming from the back. I never see her. Well, Elvis told Red that, uh, unbeknownst to me, that he really liked me. He said, uh, he told Red, he said, I saw that happening with Melinda and said, your cousin man never got mad. He said he just took it, you know, and, and he said, I like that. So just tell him, be sure and look us up when we get back to Germany. Germany meant the army, where Elvis served for the next two years. It was there that some of his most enduring friendships would begin. I was drafted in the army same time he was in 1958. Um, went to Fort Hood, Texas, did basic training there. I didn't meet him there. I saw him around base once in a while, but the post was too big. I went over to Germany. Uh, about a month before he did. And the only reason he didn't come over at the same time I went over is because his mother passed away before he left for Germany. So he went to, to Memphis and uh, took care of all the funeral arrangements there. And so I went over. But on the uh, ship going over, they put him in sergeant quarters so that uh, other soldiers wouldn't bother him for autographs all the time. So uh, he requested that I be up there with him. And I said, well, I just can't go up. I said, you got to ask the commander. And the commander told him, said, well, after everybody's settled, yeah, he can move up there. So I moved into the sergeant's quarters with Elvis. He's away from the United States. He's living on his own um, with some family members and the hangers-on that he picks up in the military, who will come to be known as the Memphis Mafia, his buddies. They will become lifelong buddies after that. He had a house he rented over there for his uh, grandmother and his father, and uh, went there, went to his house, and West introduced me to him. And Elvis walked up to me and he said, hi, I'm Elvis Presley, and I introduced myself. And that's a moment that really sticks out in my mind quite a bit. When Elvis smiled at you, had this little grin on his face, it, it really made you feel good. I mean, he had that certain aura about him that really relaxed you. On Sundays, he wanted to go play touch football, and a bunch of the guys would come over. 
and you know, guys that were in his outfit there. I never did play because I was too little. I get hurt. He said, Joe, you're on my team today. He said, uh, I said, fine, let's go. So we went to this little field not too far from the house and had a great football game. Another friend from Memphis, Lamar Fike, tried to enlist but was rejected because of his weight. He went to Germany anyway and lived with Elvis's family. Lamar Fike called me and they said, Elvis was getting a 15 day leave. He said, can you, can you get a 15 day leave, Charles? And I said, yeah, I said, okay, I'll go see. So I went and asked my sergeant. He said, yeah, you can have one. I told him that Elvis wanted me to go to Paris with him. We went on leave to Paris, France in uh, January of 1960 before he got out of the service. His dad, Vernon, uh, him and I became friends, and he said, Joe, here, I want to give you the money. You keep track of all the money when you get back so I know what happens, because usually nobody ever gives us, you know, they take the money, spend, never get receipts back. And Joe did something that no one had ever done for Elvis. And that's when they'd pay a bill or something, Joe would get all the receipts. And uh, Elvis said, why are you doing that? And Joe said, well, you can count this off on your income taxes. Well, nobody had ever done that for Elvis. I mean, all his friends, the hangers, whatever, just spend the money and enjoy it, you know? And so he saw a man of value there. Came back, I gave Vernon all the receipts for all the money, and paid the hotel bills, paid all the bills, and he was just thrilled. He had something that showed where the money went. And I, I don't know for sure, but I'm sure him and his dad talked about it. And before we left the service, Elvis uh, and I took a ride in the car, drove around Van Nuyheim, and he asked what I was gonna do when I got out of the service. I'm, go back to Chicago, get a job like I had before, and he said, why don't you come to work for me? And that was a shock, and that's how it all happened. From that time on, I was with him. While Joe earned the respect of Elvis and Vernon Presley almost immediately, it would take a little longer to win over Elvis's manager, Colonel Tom Parker. When I first met the Colonel, you know, I was the only Yankee Italian guy from Chicago that joined the organization. Before that, it was all cousins and friends that always went to school, Red West, his cousin Gene Smith, uh, Lamar Fike, they were all from the South. And I came along, and I think Colonel didn't know me. You know, he never met me before, and all of a sudden I'm working for Elvis. So he had his concerns about me. I mean, he didn't know about me that well, and you know, what is this guy doing here from Chicago, and all of a sudden he's sort of in charge of things. and. We had a few dis misunderstandings uh, in the first few months, but I think after he got to know me and I got to know him a little better, because I was a little frightened of him too, we uh, became very good friends and uh, we socialized quite a bit. His army hitch over, Elvis quickly found his way back to Hollywood, but not before stopping off in Memphis to pick up a few things and a few friends. I got the love to Occupation G.I. Blues. Elvis was going to Hollywood to do G.I. Blues. I was down at the train station. I, I even left my clothes at his house. And I was down there, and Elvis looked down. He said, do you want to go to Hollywood? I said, why not? I said, but I don't have my clothes here. I said, they're out at your house. I said, we'll buy you some out there. Let's get on the train. <laughs> and so that's how it started. Go, go do the GI Blues, and he asked if I'd like to come work for him. And I said, well, yeah, you know. He said, I said, what'd I do? He says, just bear with me, man, just do what I need done, you know, things that I can't do. And I said, sure. So I gave him a two weeks notice and went to work for him. We went out to do GI Blues, and that was the start of it. You ever, ever, you ever get, ever get. The new decade marked a new beginning for Elvis and his crew as they settled into their glamorous new jobs and their fancy new digs. We stayed at the Beverly Hills Show Hotel, great hotel, uh, probably the nicest hotel in Beverly Hills at that time. Had a nice suite, penthouse on the top. And then we had this other suite on the eighth floor that uh, Elvis lived in and myself and Gene. And there were some residents who lived in that hotel. And we used to get into little water battles. And we'd start out with water guns, and that wouldn't be enough. Then we'd get glasses of water to throw on each other. And then we started putting heads on it with shaving cream, <laughs> you know. Just any wild idea. And we'd get, uh, I think one time we came in, Water was dripping from the ceiling. And somebody ran down the hall and somebody had given Elvis an old cheap guitar and he threw it down the hall and the lady looked out and ducked back in because it went right by her head and broke it all to pieces when he hit down there. 
Well, not long after that, we began looking for a house. <laughs> what I almost liked about the house was that it was very spacious. It, it felt better in a hotel room, which naturally I think it would anyhow. And the pool, we go sit around the pool, obviously it worked out, it was karate in the backyard, and uh, had a lot of friends over there, and pool parties, swimming, and uh, it was much more private. Well, here, here's two little old country boys, we ain't never been anywhere in our life. We walk in the door, and there's this big, beautiful mansion, big chand crystal chandelier, marble hallways, stairways going up both sides. We walk in the house, and I know my eyes are real big, and Jimmy's is big, and there's all these beautiful girls walking around. Every one of them looks like a movie star. I mean, oh my gosh, you know we've made it now. <laughs> we, we have actually made it, right? Elvis inducted one member of the Memphis Mafia who stood out from the rest of the guys because she wasn't a guy at all. I first met Elvis in uh, November of 1960. I was 17 years old, and I was with a girlfriend driving down Santa Monica Boulevard, and we saw a big black Rolls Royce. And we went, drove, drove up to it to see who was in it, and it was Elvis Presley. I couldn't believe it was Elvis Presley, and we pretended like we didn't know who he was, just to be different. And he rolled down the window, and I said, gee, you look familiar. Do I know you from somewhere? And he laughed, because he knew we, that we knew who he was. And we, He was going to radio recorders, actually, to record uh, Flaming Star the song from Flaming Star, the movie he had just finished. And they gave us phone numbers, said, come up to the house, we have parties at the house. Well, after a while, she was around so much, she was just one of the guys. And so we didn't hide anything from her. In 17 years, I had to listen <laughs> to all their girlfriend problems, all their marital problems, all their sex life. Now, nothing was censored, nothing was censored. I was, they call me one of the guys, you know? But they were like my big brother, so I mean, you don't censor from your sister, you know? We all got along great together. Well, if you had to, or you couldn't stay in this group. But he goes, Elvis would not have anybody working for him that couldn't get along with everybody else and, and fit in into the inner circle. When he started about shooting again in movies and everything, he wanted all the fellas to become extras so they could be in scenes. Till you bring your groovy self on home. And then they, he could look out and see a sympathetic face because there is his friends out there. But we, we learned little tricks too. And that was not to let your face be seen on camera. That way you could work every day. Because <laughs> once it's all you, you couldn't work no more, see? They'd work as actors, they'd work as extras, they'd work as stuntmen, they were his pals, and there really, to be honest, wasn't that much for them to do. Not entirely true, says Joe Esposito, especially after he took charge. Before I came into the picture, uh, nobody had a specific job. He took his friends with him, his relatives on tour in Hollywood, so nobody had a specific job, but when we got out of the service, Elvis became a little more organized himself, being in the Army. So he needed somebody to oversee everybody's specific job. And that was my job, to make sure people had a certain job to do, make sure it got done uh, without always having to tell one guy one thing, he'd tell me and I would tell all of them. And basically that's what it was. I became, it was like, they called me the foreman. That's what it was. When I first started with Elvis in 1961, my capacity was uh, basically a gopher, <laughs> I guess you'd say. Uh, but uh, I became his wardrobe manager. Uh, which means that I, I bought all of his clothes for him, his personal clothes, wardrobe, uh, or, or had them custom made for him uh, or whatever, and I was his, uh, one of his bodyguards, and I was his movie stand-in in 23 movies. So I had my hand full right there. I used to cut the guy's hair, and you know, Elvis didn't like to miss out on anything, so he said to me one day, he said, would you come and give me a haircut? Well, I panic, you know, I said, Elvis Presley, I gotta cut his hair, we go upstairs, he's got this fabulous barber chair, and I cut his hair, and he gave me $750 for the first time, for my first haircut, $750. I said, thank you, <laughs> that was good. <laughs> but after that, I would never take his money, I'd throw it back at him, because I lived there practically, you know, he'd, he bought beautiful gifts, I'd eat there, you know, I mean, he took care of me, I mean, I couldn't take his money. 
And then at that time, Elvis was making about six movies a year around MGM or whatever the heck he was making. And each time they would have dancers in it, they would call us up and Elvis would send, I don't know if Joe was one of the people, but all I could was Memphis Mafia guys would come and watch the girls audition. And they would tell the ones that, that he wanted to pick. Elvis would like her, Elvis worked with her before. El so we all got hired again. I mean, not that we didn't deserve to get hired. We were also very good, but it was a little bit of a little boost in the right direction. So, which was very nice. You know, he, he was comfortable and he was loyal to his friends, obviously. He was loyal to the guys that he brought from Memphis. And so it was very nice to be in his inner circle. Making movies with Elvis was not a job. It was a pleasure. Every day was like a holiday. Every day was fun. Now, we probably drove a lot of directors and producers to drinking, taking drugs, and having gray hair because we cut up on the sets more than we did any time in any place. From the time we got there in the morning to the time we left, it was practical jokes. It could be anything from uh, water gun fights, uh, firecrackers, uh, whipped cream fights, uh, you name it. Anything that could go on, we did it. Those guys always had something crazy going uh, to get you to, during the down times, you know, to, while they're lighting the set or whatever. And uh, they blew up my makeup case one time, and uh, oh. she, she never knew. Oh, yeah, and the Roman candles. I remember Roman candle fights. Golly. It's crazy. Well, you wouldn't get hurt, you know, with them stupid fireballs coming at you. <laughs> Bill uh, had decided that we'd had enough of the fireworks and the firecrackers and everything during this particular job. So he called uh, over the wardrobe people and he said, now look, he said, uh, we're gonna get some pies here. So the last day of the shoot, Bill said, we gotta do something. We've got to get Elvis at the end of the shoot. The prop guys, we all got together and had all these pies made up and then we had a, you know, half a dozen of the crew all lined up. <laughs> So I remember we all kind of lined up with our pies, trying to hide them and everything, and they were doing this uh, scene. <laughs> when the director yelled, all right, it's a wrap. Pies flew from everywhere. They all attacked Elvis. He had this blue suit on, and they all just hit him with these pies. <laughs> we were waiting, man. We just buried those guys. And they got back at him, and Elvis didn't know what to do. He was covered in pie and whipped cream and stuff, so uh, Bill got back at him. Uh, that was a great one. That was over at MGM, yeah. But that wasn't over. Elvis said it one, one more. So that evening, usually after the, at the end of the shoot, a lot of the guys would go to this little bar right around the corner from the studio and have a drink, a beer after. So we all got together. Elvis said, okay, get some pies. We're going to go over and get Bill. So we snuck around. We knew he was there. We all went in the back door, and we got him right in the bar. We just plastered him with pies. So Elvis got back at Bill Reynolds. And it was during this period that a little bit of rivalry popped up between um, Elvis and his buddies and Sinatra and his buddies. You know, they were the Rat Pack, and Elvis had, of course, the Memphis Mafia. And there actually were a few magazine spreads at the time and things like, you know, the movie magazines at the time about is there a feud going on between these two, you know, Hollywood gangs. The newspapers were trying to make a rival thing between Frank Sinatra and the Rat Pack and Elvis and the Memphis Mafia. There never was. Uh, the only time we actually were with all the Rat Pack at one time is when Elvis did a TV special in 1960 when he came back from the service. Otherwise, you know, we saw Mr. Sinatra's shows. We, Sammy Davis was a good friend of Elvis's. Dean Martin, Elvis loved Dean Martin. So there was, never was ever a rivalry between Rat Pack, Memphis Mafia. We were all friends. Legend has it that the name the Memphis Mafia was coined by veteran entertainment reporter Rona Barrett. They were always around him, dressed very nattily, and were there to protect them. And it always reminded me of men that we always associated with the Mafia who were always there again around the Dons. And Elvis was the Don, and these guys were his, his men. And because they came from Memphis, we just attached the name Mafia Memphis to them. But I don't know if I was the very first one who did it. I do know that I used the expression on many an occasion. 
The Memphis Mafia, that title was given to us by, I don't know if it was a Las Vegas uh, reporter, because we used to do that a lot in Las Vegas. So we'd all pull up in a limousine, or a big Rolls Royce limousine, and we'd all have black suits on and black shirts and white ties, or the opposite, white shirt, white tie, you know, whatever. We look like a mob, and with sunglasses, and Elvis liked that because he was intrigued with, with mob, and he liked to be different, and so, uh, uh, that's what we did, mohair suits, and somebody say, hey, Elvis and the Memphis Mafia showed up in town tonight. Now, we never had that name, we never thought of it, and we thought it was funny, we enjoyed it, it was a big kick. And uh, uh, Rona didn't come up with that name, I'm sure she, she wrote it in her articles and stuff, but uh, no, she never came up with the idea of the Memphis Mafia. It was very important for him to have people that he knew around him, because he couldn't go out and do things like you and I could, because of him being so famous. He couldn't even go for a hamburger in the drugstore. I mentioned, I said, doesn't this disturb you that you don't have real freedom of movement? And he said, oh yeah. He said, I often think that if I weren't young, I don't know if I could take this. He said, of course, I have my cousin and then we always meet somebody and the girlfriends come up and we, we eat and uh, they send out for food for me, anything I want, but uh, it is very difficult. He took us to the movies. The guys would call ahead. We'd time it 10 minutes after it started. Joe Esposito got out and went and bought all the tickets and then came back. And then we waited till the movie just started and it was dark in the theater. And then we all went in and like a, an army, you know, we took the like one of the last rows and we just took up the whole row. It was Elvis and all the guys and they all had dates. I think we saw a half an hour of it before that whole theater started buzzing. Elvis, he, he was electric. You just knew he was there. And the whole theater, nobody was watching the movie. It was just Elvis Presley's here, Elvis Presley's here. You could hear the whole theater. And he'd give that signal, which meant everybody get up and run for it. So he just stood up, snapped his fingers, the whole row got up and we left. So then I had to have my mother take me back so I could see the end of the movie. <laughs> it was hard to really get close to him because when you would start talking to him, his gang, the Memphis Mafia, I don't know, I suspect it was set up that way, would distract him. That's one reason why I could never marry the Elvis, when you really get down to it, because you are not alone very often. There were very few times in our life that we were totally alone. They were always there. They lived with him. They took care of him. They did everything he said and they were always there, and they were always gonna be there. We did everything together. When I was slept, we slept. When I was partied, we partied. When I was worked, we worked. We did everything together. And those guys, they were from the South. They were different. I was a California guy, I'd been an athlete. I ended up playing quarterback in this football team on occasion. But I mean, you know, they're Southern guys. They're, they were tough, you know, redneck guys. What I mean by that is, I mean, you know, they were men. They, they came out here and, you know, they weren't from the theater. They were, you know, they were redneck boys. They wore funny little cuffs and things like that. But, you know, they were hell of, they were good guys. I liked them. The Hollywood community viewed him as an outsider, uh, a little bit of a hillbilly, you know, surrounded by those, those guys, his Memphis Mafia buddies and stuff. And as a result of shutting him out, Elvis Presley sort of created his own kingdom in Hollywood, you know, at his bachelor pads, which became a little bit notorious for their swinging parties and that whole scene. We had a lot of parties, but our parties were very tame, really. Uh, they were sitting around talking, uh, drinking sodas. We didn't have alcohol in the house in the early 60s. Uh, he didn't care for any, no beer cans or booze. And, and we went along with it too. We just had fun. We went up to this house and um, I think, this is no party. This is Elvis and the guys and they're watching TV or playing pool or something. He just wants to have people around him. But you know, we're here, so we'll see. You know, there's no chips and dips. There's no, it's no party. The parties were really just a lot of women there, and what we ever did was watch television most of the time. And uh, sometimes, and my favorite times, when the guys would get together and sing gospel. I always say I'm the only Jewish girl that knows every gospel song there is. But it was mostly just socializing. And the, the funny part is that to see who would get to sit closest to Elvis. If one girl would get up, another girl would run and sit next to Elvis. And if she'd get up and go to the bathroom, another girl would sit down there. Just like that, was, that was the enjoyment of watching the entertainment. But there was an unspoken rule 
if Elvis was sat on the couch and there, there was, was a, a there book. was a binder at the side of him, you didn't sit there because he was either expecting somebody or having somebody come or he didn't want anybody sitting there for that particular night and that's what happened. Even with all the parties, the guys would sometimes complain about being bored. To liven things up, Elvis brought a new member into their fold, a mischievous chimpanzee named... Scatter. That monkey caused more trouble than you could ever believe. And this chimpanzee was a little bastard. <laughs> and he used to I'd run up to the girls with his hands up in the air and start screeching. And, and he'd, he'd drink all the drinks that were left on the tables. And then he'd lift up the girls' dresses. He would steal the jewelry off a girl's fingers and rings and stuff. And, and he had a little, like a little pack rat. He had a lot, a lot of jewelry stuffed on, uh, hid under the piano. But, and he liked to bite. So I was going, this was on Bellagio, I believe, and I came in the den one day, and he came running up to me with his hands in there with that screeching. Well, I thought he was going to bite me, so I gave him a right hook, and he flew across the room. And I thought Elvis, Elvis fell off the couch laughing, but that chimpanzee never came near me again, ever. <laughs> it was funny. <laughs> one night he got loose in Bel Air, and our next door neighbors were having a party, and uh, Scatter got loose, and uh, somehow made his way down to their backyard party. And he's out in the middle of this party backyard, and, and he's screaming and raving, raising his arms and hollering, and people are just running everywhere. So we, we got him, me and Alan got him, we brought him back to the house, and we apologized to the people, we were sorry, and we didn't mean for him to get out. Well, the next day, we get a letter from the Bel Air Association, the monkey has to go or we gotta go. <laughs> so Elvis says, okay guys, let's send him back to Memphis. So we sent him back to Memphis. Primates aside, not everyone who knew Elvis liked the Memphis Mafia or thought it was a good idea that they were always around. Mac Davis remembers one night at the movies. I went out to use the bathroom and uh, one of the gang around him came back and says, you know, I hate to tell you this, Mr. Davis, but uh, you're not supposed to be sitting next to Elvis. <laughs> <laughs> I said, uh, tell me if I'm wrong, but what was it Elvis that invited me to come down and go to the movie? And he said, yeah, but nobody sits. He says, you notice Sonny and Red West don't even sit with him. Joe sits behind him. Everybody sits back in the back. I said, well, where was I supposed to sit? And he said, well, with the invited guests back, and there was a row back in the back for all the, the local people. And boy, I got hot. He said, no, no, don't get upset. I said, I am upset. I am thoroughly upset. And that was a big deal about it. The movie was letting out and Elvis came up. He said, what's the matter? He says, you look upset. And I told him what had happened. And he said, who said that? And I said, that, I don't want to get anybody in trouble. I just said, you know, I just think you ought to know that this, is, this goes on around you all the time. I don't see how you can have a life. I think there was, there was he had too many people with him. When you build an entourage like that, you sort of lose yourself. Um, everybody catering to you, everybody saying yes, everybody doing this, everybody, you know, worshiping because of the money. Everything was, the cars that he gave the people, the gifts he gave the people, the watches, you know. That's wonderful, but it's not natural. It's, uh, you don't buy your friendships. That's the way he shows appreciation. Instead of sitting there saying, listen, I thank you very much for doing a great job for me, you're the best, I need you and all that, he'd give you a gift. That's the way he shows appreciation. Elvis bought a house for me. Elvis bought a couple of Cadillacs for me. Elvis bought my parents a house. He bought them a car. He walks over, stick your hand out. I stuck my hand out. He drops the keys in and he says, Merry Christmas. And he said, that's your, your Christmas gift. I said, Elvis, you mean that car is for me for Christmas? He said, yep, it's yours. Merry Christmas, GK. And you could have knocked me over with a feather. And I said, Elvis, I'm, I'm flabbergasted. I don't, I'm, I don't, I'm lost in words. I don't know what to say. And he put his arm around me. He said, GK, he says, what is fame and fortune? that you can't share with your friends. That kind of really blew me away. You gotta have some friends that have nothing to gain by knowing you other than your friendship and that care about you, you care about them, you know, that kind of thing. And I don't feel that he ever had that on a quality basis. Even Colonel Parker voiced concern about some of those close friends and their motives. The colonel uh, had his suspicions about everybody that came around Elvis. He didn't know if they were taking advantage of Elvis or what, if they were going to do their job correctly. And there were some people did not like uh, the colonel. The colonel sees the Memphis Mafia as a threat. Um, he sees some other Elvis hanger-ons as kind of a threat. You know, Elvis is tied in with some folks who espouse different kind of 
we'd call them new age religious beliefs, things like that. That's starting to kind of get on the colonel's nerves. I know that he was very nervous about me. Here I am, this young guy in Hollywood, and I'm bringing Elvis all these books on meditation and religion and spiritual growth. And this was right before the cultural revolution of the 60s. And I think it was a big question mark in Colonel Parker's mind. I mean, what is this guy trying to do? Is he trying to uh, get him to uh, become his manager? Is he going to fill him with new ideas that are go that's going to set Elvis off in another direction? He didn't know. I didn't understand why he always had to have these guys around him. Even to this day, I've never really quite understood because we've had many a superstar in Hollywood, and none of them ever really seemed to need an entourage, but Elvis did. He didn't need all the guys around him, but he wanted them around him. He felt comfortable because he knew them first and then hired them secondly. In other words, they, they understood him, so he felt more comfortable with us around him. He wanted his friends around. I understand that. I want my friends around, too. Especially, you know, the, the more lonely you get, the more out there in stardom. I mean, it must have been scary for him, this guy from Tupelo, Mississippi, all of a sudden having icons and Frank Sinatra and kings and queens bowing down to him. He's like, I want my friends with me from, from Memphis, okay? I'll think of something for them to do. I mean, I love him for that. And Elvis kept his friends around as the 1960s marched on and his Hollywood days gave way to the Vegas nights. When Elvis played Vegas, uh, we'd go in two weeks at a time uh, just to have a good time first before the show started. We went and saw all the other stars in town, uh, you know, Cena Sinatra's, the Dean Martin's, the Sammy Davis's, and all the big stars. Because Elvis loves shows too, loved entertainers, go to the lounge acts, see all the lounge acts. Las Vegas, I think, was his happiest time when he got on the stage. I mean, it became Elvis Presley. It was like, it was like there's two different Elvis. The one at home is different. When he got on the stage, he blew it all out, man. He loved entertaining. He had the women in his hands, he had the man in his, men in his hands. He just, he had the best time. He had a blast up there. Yeah, one night with you. I always loved Vegas. He liked it because it was a 24-hour day place. You know, no clocks, didn't care what time of day it was, didn't mean anything except when you had to work. But even the life of a superstar can become routine. All the life in Las Vegas was like eat, sleep, and entertain. We didn't do anything, really. I mean, a couple of nights we went out just to see some gospel singers, but mostly in the suite for the whole month. Order some food, and sit down and eat, and watch TV. Elvis had a piano up there, sit and play gospel music, sing with all the, the musicians and the backup singers. Uh, we would do that till daylight. Then we'd all run in our rooms and close the blackout drapes and go to sleep like vampires. And that's the way it was. It went that way for 30 days. Sometimes we never saw daylight. That's how bad it was. We looked like ghosts when we came out of it after 30 days. Didn't see the sun. Las Vegas was the setting for one of the happiest days of Elvis Presley's life. It was there on May 1st, 1967, that Elvis married Priscilla Beaulieu at the Aladdin Hotel. I was one of 14 people at Elvis's wedding. I was a groomsman. It was a, it was a magical moment for me. I was very uh, impressed and taken back and so proud that he wanted me at his, at his wedding. And uh, I'll never forget it the rest of my life. It was really a moment that will go down in, in, in my memory bank forever. Only two other members of the Memphis Mafia were at the wedding. And oddly enough, they ended up sharing the title of best man. Elvis asked Marty Lacker to be his best man at the time, before he asked me. And uh, that was fine. I had no problems with that. But about, you know, a few, a few weeks later, Elvis and I were alone, and he said, Joe, he says, you know, I, I changed my mind. I'd rather have you as my best man. And I said, well, you can't very well do that. You know, you can't kick Marty out of it. I mean, you asked him. I mean, that'd be terrible. I, I have, you know, we have to work together. And I said, you know, why don't we just be both best man for it? And basically, that's what happened. But there were still some ruffled feathers that day. They had set up one room to be it, and it was just room enough for the immediate families. And, and Joe and Marty as best men. And I, it didn't bother me, but uh, the rest of the guys really got upset because they thought they was all going to get to be at the wedding. But, it, but they were all at the wedding breakfast, which I thought was fine. You know, I knew couldn't everybody be in there, but some of the people really got upset. I'm sorry they did, 
because it wasn't meant to upset anyone. It was just him doing, Colonel doing what he always tried to do with Elvis, and that was keeping a, something like that a wedding from becoming a circus. Las Vegas may have been the site of Elvis's wedding and many of his triumphant concert appearances, but it was never home. Elvis always returned to the place he loved best. Memphis was where I think he was the most comfortable. He had a good time in Memphis. He, he was home, you know. At Graceland, you know, we go, uh, uh, go to the fairgrounds, rent the fairgrounds you know, all night, and invite 100 people there. Everything was compliments of Elvis. And we just ride till daylight come up. Any ride you wanted to do, we had a ball. It was fun. Roller rink was the same thing. Movies. Elvis loved movies. You know, you want to see some movies, and we called the movie theater and said, we're going to come in after it. You know, it closes at 11.30. We'd be there at 12 o'clock. Sit there and just watch it and have a good time. The first time I got there, he, he took me on a complete tour. He took me to Humes High. He took me to show me where he grew up. He took me to see Sun Records. He took me to his mom's grave. I mean, I mean it was really, really special for me, you know. But I think he was really happy there. He was very comfortable there. He had his friends in. And he, he liked, you know, he, we, he liked to play, you know. We all, we all played together. It was really fun. Every 4th of July and every New Year's, we'd have firework fights at Grayson. And uh, these became real battles. And I'm serious now. These, these were real battles. And we start out lighting a Roman candle and shooting at each other. Elvis came out with his football helmet on, his glasses, and I had a Roman candle, and I kept popping him in the ear with a Roman candle, and it burned his ear to almost like a piece of bacon. And Elvis would run away from me, and I went, Choo! <laughs> and it went right up through the middle of his hair. <laughs> and then we'd get, we'd get, we'd start getting like one in each hand. And then Elvis run up and popped me in the eye with a Roman candle, which almost blinded me. And I fell on the ground, and I was holding my eyes, and I said, that's enough, I stop, I stop, I stop, I quit, I quit. And he just kept popping me in the butt with his Roman candles because he thought I was faking. But I was really hurt. And we learned over the years to wear gloves, snowmobile mask, <laughs> you know. Too many of us started getting hurt, so we stopped it, you know. It was fun for a while. <laughs> it was Christmas time, and we were all up at Graceland, and uh, usually, the day before Christmas, Elvis gave out bonuses to the guys who worked for him and to close relatives. So I just happened to be around. Of course, I wasn't working for Elvis at the time, so I expected nothing. Elvis is walking around, and he's passing out, and everybody thought it was their Christmas bonus. They open it up, and they look at it. They look at Elvis, and they make a funny face. And I opened it up, and I looked at it, and I looked at Elvis, and I could tell he was biting his lip to keep from laughing. And what it was was it was a McDonald gift certificate for two free hamburgers at McDonald's. And I said, Elvis, and he said, and he, and he busted out laughing. And everybody else was a little nervous because they thought that was their bonus. And then, of course, he reached in his, in, his, in his pocket of his suit and pulled out the real bonuses and passed them around. And they, they started laughing and clapping hands, you know, giving him a high five. But uh, it, it was a fun situation. There was uh, an incident once at Graceland where Elvis caught some of the guys in his entourage you know, looking at the video monitor, you know, which showed the fans clustered outside the Graceland gates, and they were choosing the most beautiful fans to get to come on into the house. They were choosing, you know, beautiful slim blondes and gorgeous redheads, and, you know, and they were making comments about, about the women's figures and faces and things like that. And Elvis came in and saw them doing this and said, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Don't do that. Don't be that way. And he just pointed to some of the, you know, the average people standing in line, overweight, um, imperfect people standing in line, clustered around. He said, bring them in. Bring them in, too. Please don't ever do that to people. Now, we never did things like that. We used to go down to the gate. Yes, of course we did. We went down to the gate once in a while, you know, if nobody had a date that night, and take a walk down to the gate and look around, see who's there. And, you see a pretty girl, you talk to somebody, you say, hey, what are you doing tonight, you know? And it had to be a little cool about it. You just couldn't say, you know, come on up because all the other people would get their feelings hurt. You know, you could say, hey, listen, you want to meet me down the, down the street at the coffee shop or wherever it was, and I'll be over there in an hour and we'll have a cup of coffee, and then I can bring them back and just drive into the house with them. And a lot of the guys did that. Joe, we used to lovingly refer to him as Gentleman Joe. 
because he always was a perfect and true gentleman. He was very loving, he was very kind, uh, he was always very devoted to Elvis and always had Elvis's best interest at heart. Linda Thompson was Elvis's girlfriend from 1972 until 1976. She knew somebody who'd be just perfect for the Memphis Mafia. I was a real cop. I had been through the police academy. Uh, I had a full commission and uh, was trained in, in everything from automatic weapons down to a revolver and was licensed to carry them. With Elvis, everything was a family experience. You know, Elvis embraced his family wholeheartedly and with open arms. He embraced the men who worked for him as if they were family. They all traveled together, played together, shared holidays together. So he was a very familial person and it just seemed very natural that my only sibling, a brother, who was in law enforcement uh, in Memphis at the time, was hired by Elvis to be one of his bodyguards. He was really crazy about law enforcement and he, he told me many times, and I'm sure he told other people this too, that, that if he hadn't done what he did, that he would have liked to have been a cop. Elvis's fascination with law enforcement made him that much more appreciative of his bodyguards. Elvis bragged about Red and I uh, on more than one occasion, and it wasn't a cocky way, it was just a sincere way. He said, I got two guys there that'll take the bullet, the knife, the gun, the club, the bar stool. Those two guys will take it for me and try to take the person out so that I'm not hurt. He said, he said you know how good that makes me feel? know that I've got someone like that. And it, and, and it made Red and I feel proud because he was right. We, we were committed to do that. But sometimes Elvis gave his bodyguards headaches, like the time he went AWOL from Graceland. Nobody knew where he was for several hours until a phone rang on the other side of the country. And I got this call late at night, and I said, who is this? He said, it's me. So I said, Elvis, <laughs> where are you? And I forgot where I thought he I think he said he was in Dallas changing planes. Would you meet me at the airport? And I said, well, who's with you? Of course I'll meet you, but who, you know? He said, nobody. I said, nobody. This was unheard of. Never. It was the only time it ever happened. And he said, Jerry, I don't want anybody to know where I am. Elvis also wanted Jerry to fly with him to Washington, D.C., so he could hand deliver a letter to the White House. And we get there, Elvis kind of jumps out of the back of the limo, uh, he's got the cane, and you wouldn't recognize him because it was, it was dusk. So I jumped out of the limousine and I said, you know, this is Mr. Presley, he just wanted to drop off the letter to the president. And they really warmed up when they found out it was Elvis Presley. In the meantime, Sonny West had flown up from Memphis to join Elvis and Jerry. Together, the three of them headed for the White House. We went over there, and they took Elvis and went one way with him. They took Jerry and I to another building. They took Elvis into the Oval Room and said that Sonny and I could not go. And uh, we said, well, you know, that was pretty hard to say no to. You don't know Elvis, man. You don't know Elvis. He'll get us in over there. He'll do it. A few minutes later, the phone rings, and the president wants to see Mr. Presley's friends. And the White House aide said, you know, I've seen people leave their mothers, grandmothers. He was really impressed that Elvis had gotten us in there. Man, I just got chill bumps down my back. I mean, I could not believe it. This was happening so fast. This is all within 30 minutes from the time I arrived at the, the hotel. 30 minutes I'm in town, I'm gonna go meet President Nixon. As soon as that door opened and Elvis said, come on in, I was, I, I was kind of frozen because it is an Oval Office, and down at the end, I saw Nixon. He was at his desk signing something. And, and I just thought of all the stuff that's gone on in this room. And Elvis pushes me. He said, don't be afraid, you know. He says, I, I got something for you fellas. And he walks back over to his desk, opens up, pulls open the drawer, and gets these two key ring with the presidential seal on them, 14 karat gold. He walks over and he gives me one, he gives Jerry one, and Elvis looks at him and said, they got wives too, Mr. President. And so Nixon and, and Elvis both went back over to the, the president's uh, drawers and fumbling around for stuff to, for us to take home. Elvis had a gift for the president too, a World War I pistol from Presley's own collection. He wasn't able to give it to him, he had to tell him about it because the Secret Service wouldn't let it in. Both of these men 
did not want this meeting exploited. And you know, it didn't come out for like a ne another year when the Washington Post got it, which is amazing that, you know, we were at the White House, you know, for a few hours. And uh, the fact that the press did not get out for a year was amazing. What did get out were stories about Elvis's drug use. After being fired in a cost-cutting move, Red and Sonny West bit the hand that had fed them for two decades. Along with Dave Hebler, they wrote Elvis, What Happened? When we wrote this book, it was, it was out of bitterness and hurt to start with. I tell you, when we were given three days notice by his father and a week's pay after 16 years, and he wouldn't talk to us himself, he flew out of town and he had his father do it. While it was being written, we were getting chapters of it, and that's what made it worse because we knew where they were going with it, and that's what affected him more than anything. Uh, uh, I think it really, personally inside, really hurt him tremendously, and uh, instead of uh, trying to do something about it, it only made him worse. So instead of trying to clean his act up, he became more and more depressed. We wanted to point out to him you know, what he was doing, not only to himself, but to the people around him. And uh, we, we didn't want him to, to be what he was. We wanted him to be what we knew he could be and had been. And that's what I meant when I said maybe it will do some good for him, for the drug culture, for people to realize no one is out of reach of drugs, man. Here is a man that had it in the palm of his hand and started off with it that way, and the drugs took it away from him. We wanted more than anything else to see him as he was in his prime, on the stage, just knocking him dead. Yeah. The book was published on August 1st, 1977. Two weeks later, Rona Barrett was discussing it on Good Morning America. I had just come off the air and got a phone call that they had just discovered Elvis's body and he was dead. I was in shock total shock. I thought for a fast moment that we had contributed. Not meaning to, but by be the, being the first person to review this book that laid it all out. And people knowing that I don't make up stories and reaching the kind of audience that I reached on Good Morning America. I thought maybe we had sent Elvis over the edge that he thought there was no way of coming back. I will never know. Then Red called. And they came over. They walked in that door and I hugged Red. He was crying, Pat was crying, his wife, Judy. We just hugged each other and was very upset, very upset over it what had happened. Something we knew was probably going to happen if he didn't stop doing what he did a year earlier when we were trying to stop it. What's been the reaction of the family to the allegations which have been made that the death was caused by an overdose of drugs? It wouldn't surprise me because it always comes up with something different. Is there they, any they truth? All, no, no truth whatsoever. They came up with that report before the autopsy was even out. They, they made a statement like that. I don't know how the press said that. Joe was then asked about the infamous well, book. I react to them. I hope they have to live with they, what they wrote. That's all I can tell you. You have to believe what you want to believe. If you read that kind of book, that's fine. Over the years, uh, you know, I've been told that, you know, they read and wanted to make a, 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 get a point to Elvis, you know, to try clean up your life. You know, what are you doing to yourself? And I understand that, you know, because uh, Red uh, really uh, loved Elvis. I think Red West will never forgive himself for writing that book about Elvis because they were really, really close friends. Twenty-five years after Elvis's death, several members of the Memphis Mafia remain close, sharing a special bond with each other and with Elvis Presley, a friend, indeed a family member, who will never be forgotten. There 
was something very special about him that goes beyond just being a friend. He was just uh, a giving person. And you just, you just knew that he loved you without him ever telling you. And the love between all of us when we were together, you, you couldn't be, you could feel the vibes in the group. You could feel it. One guy one time said, some idiot professor did a, I saw his interview on something, he says, we killed Elvis. The guys around Elvis killed him, you know, because we sheltered him, whatever it was. And if I would have saw that, this tape was about four years ago, if I would have saw that, I would turn around and sue him for slander. But it's too late now. But he was a total stranger, never knew Elvis Presley, never met him. He just assumed that the guys around him were just a bunch of leeches and all we cared about was ourselves, not Elvis. That's not true. We all loved Elvis and we were there for him 24 hours a day. And that, I want to make sure it gets clear. This was the most incredible person. He was a, a wonderful boy. He was a wonderful man. He was a fantastic friend. And I was really lucky to be a part of his life and to be a part of his legacy, and I'm really proud of it, you know? I mean, it's wonderful, and, and it, it's, he's made me in a different kind of person. He changed my life completely, and I miss him terribly. I'd like the fans to know, and I know they know, that uh, he was a human being, very special human being, but he was a human being. You know, I would like for them to have the good fortune that I had uh, of knowing him. He, in all instances, would be the guy that they think he is. He wasn't perfect, but uh, he was the best man I've ever known.